Early in Mars's four and a half billion year history, just after its fiery creation, molten iron convecting in the planet's core generated a powerful dynamo that sent waves of magnetism emanating out from the planet. This magnetosphere protected the planet from solar radiation and ushered in the Noachian period, a time when fresh volcanism built up an atmosphere comparable to the Earth's. Heat trapped across the surface allowed moisture to cycle around the planet as part of the hydrosphere, supplying water for rivers to flow into oceans. Altogether, what was created was the potential for biology. Over time, however, this magnetic generation stalled as the core cooled and the planet was left vulnerable to the never-ending barrage from the sun. Atom by atom, the air was stripped away, exposing the surface. Water retreated beneath the ground as ice, and Mars became what it is today, a barren outpost at the far reaches of our sun's habitable zone. But this position just within the reach of life has made Mars the focus of plans looking toward the future, plans of bringing life back to the red planet. To see how something like this may be done, we can look back at the conditions of the Noachian paradise and use them as a blueprint for making Mars habitable once again. To start, we have by far the most theoretical aspect of terraforming Mars, affecting the planet's weak inherent magnetism. In truth, there's likely little we can do to ever change this, as altering planetary mechanics remains outside the human toolbox. For now, our best bet comes instead by supplementing this magnetism. The most popular proposal is the placement of a magnetic device out ahead of the planet at what's known as a Lagrange position. Here, the competing gravity of the sun and planet counterbalance one another, locking objects into a stable position between the two bodies. If enough magnetism can be generated at this point, a trail can be cleared behind for Mars to take shelter in. If we humans are in fact capable of working together to finance, design, engineer, construct, and implement such a device, if physics even allows for something like this to exist, and if everything works out as planned, then the hard part will be over. Propped up by whatever volcanic outgassing there is left taking place across the surface, Mars maintains a weak atmosphere even today. It would be this very same leaking of gases that would invariably build the atmosphere back up, acting as a slow but persistent catalyst for releasing CO2 stores around the planet. First to disappear would be the thin layer of carbon dioxide snow that glazes the Martian North Pole each winter, kicking into motion two simultaneous feedback loops. On the one hand, more gases filling the air would raise pressures, making it harder for more dry ice to sublimate, reducing the rate at which the remaining dry ice can enter the air. This is what's called a negative feedback loop. At the same time, however, what gases do hang around in the air will further insulate the planet's surface and trap more heat, leading to more sublimation, increasing heat trapping, raising temperatures higher, driving more sublimation. I think you understand, it's a positive feedback loop. Although conflict between these opposing forces would ease the shift in global climate, warming would almost certainly continue until not even the South Pole would be cold enough to harbor dry ice. The only difference here is that seasonal deposits of CO2 ice have accumulated nearly half of the planet's air beneath the surface. Tapping into this reservoir would release a flood of new gases into the air and trigger a new age on Mars. Water ice can sublimate too, meaning that as the Martian air thickens, its capacity to hold water rises along with it, taking moisture out of the polar regions and redistributing it across the globe. Pretty soon, dense clouds would rise over the Martian skies, providing the seeds of weather. Ice would dominate the contents of the clouds at first, coming to the surface as snow or frost, but with a building atmosphere eventually water would converge in the air and fall to the surface as rain. This exchange of moisture between the polar ice, the air, and the ground marks the foundation of the water cycle. 
Even today, temperatures surrounding the Martian equator can frequently rise up to 20 degrees Celsius, providing fleeting opportunities for water in the ground to mix with salts and form a liquid brine. We find evidence for this in the walls of small craters, where gravity drags this moisture down slope, leaving darkened trails of hydration behind them. What images like this show us is that water still moves on Mars, and with temperatures rising, these melt patterns would only become more and more widespread, until soils at the bottom of craters become saturated. At this point, excess moisture will have no choice but to overflow onto the surface and form the first pools on the planet. From here, ephemeral crater lakes will proliferate across the tropical regions, at first only staying for the heat of summer before eventually becoming long-term features. As heat penetrates deeper and deeper beneath the surface of Mars, it's only a matter of time before permafrost deposits are affected. Once this layer of ice in the soil begins to melt, the biggest reservoir of water on the planet will have been unlocked. Under the pressure of surrounding rock, much of the meltwaters will float up to the surface, where they can break into patches of mud pits. Eventually, these pockets of moisture will collect into an entire hydrated layer in the soil, what we'd call groundwater. At this point, water kind of starts behaving differently. This is where microhydrology becomes macrohydrology. Yes, there will still be local water features, but now groundwaters will migrate into larger and larger basins. Sites of the new deluge will appear wherever local depressions drop beneath the regional water table, draining soil moisture onto land and eventually into seas. Erosion tells us the story of where water has been. Here, where the looming Tharsis Plateau meets the depths of Christ Planitia, we can see that the perfect conditions for groundwater sapping have been created. Providing drainage for much of this side of the volcanic province's aquifer, Mariner Valley has become defined by unrivaled degrees of erosion, giving itself away as the primary artery for the ocean, the Fountain of Mars. What started out as a cluster of at least 12 different chasms eroded into a single interconnected canyon leading water southward. The only canyons that have managed to stay separate from Mariner Valley are those that flow precisely away from it to serve as the mini springs of Mars. Closest to the equator is Echis Chasma. Here we can see water once poured from the mountainside to flow northward into a large lake bed before emptying into the sea through the Kasai Valleys. Juventa Chasma and Orson Welles Crater follow a similar design as well, both starting with steep chasms near the equator before flowing northward into their respective Maha and Shalbatana valleys. But then there's the great mystery of Hebes Chasma, the canyon without an outlet. Though at first glance it may appear connected to Echis, a closer look shows these canyons to be completely separate from one another. Without a channel to release water and debris, how weathered materials could have been transported out from this site remains unknown. What this points to is erosion driven not by surface flow removing rock, but rather by a series of underground collapses. You see, ice takes up more space than water, so when subsurface ice melts into groundwater, cavities in the earth can be created. As water moves up, it opens these chambers for heavier materials like rock to move down through, leaving pits at the surface. The fact that Hebes and the rest of these chasms all sit almost directly on the equator means that this area has the greatest groundwater potential anywhere on the planet, allowing this type of erosion to repeat over and over and over again. That's why we can see many more isolated canyons in the first stages of collapse, all of them falling parallel to the equator, aligning to where the heat is concentrated on the planet. At the center of this chasm is the Hebes Mensa, a mountain of sediment deposited here in times when a lake filled its walls. Knowing temperatures here can often exceed 20 degrees Celsius, it's hardly a stretch to expect to find water pooling here seasonally. 
Together, this might explain images like this, produced by the European Space Agency, where what appears to be at least two blue bodies forming in some of the deepest corners of this canyon. Running straight through the largest of these features is a clear channel cutting through the inner mesa to feed into the confined basin. Personally, it wasn't until I saw footage like this, where this map is projected onto a 3D model of the canyon, that I really started to believe that this could have been water. I mean, really, what else could this be? Other satellite images of the region, like those Google makes available, don't show these blue areas, but they do let us take a much closer look at where we've seen them before. Here we can see the many smaller channels running through the mesa, into a flat basin resembling a lake bed. Looking at the second significant blue spot down at the northeast corner, we can see that it again occurs within one of the deepest parts of the canyon, and again we can see familiar channels of erosion coming off the mesa leading into a flat lake bed at its base. A little further down we'll find perhaps the clearest example of liquid leaking out of the cliff sides, having left darkened trails of sediment along its route until it reaches yet another flat lake bed. Altogether, what we have here is clear evidence pointing to the fact that Hebe's chasma may very well function as a periodic watering hole, whenever planetary conditions fluctuate enough to permit. This undoubtedly makes Hebe's one of the most promising sites for sustaining life on the planet, which may help explain the second strange thing about this photograph, what appears to be green plumes propagating around the edges of the canyon walls. What causes this coloration in the soil is again unknown, as current endeavors to explore the planet have focused more around finding evidence for ancient life. By doing this, we've effectively ignored all the most promising locations where active water bodies and life might actually be found. If we want answers or even just some data to help explain these phenomena, we'll need to pay more attention to places like this, with the only way of knowing for sure being to go there ourselves. While these equatorial pits will serve fine as the first cesspools on the planet, an expanding atmosphere could push warm temperatures even further. Erosion features found at greater distances from the equator tell us of times in the past when heat did just that. Like before, these drainage features come off the greatest local changes in elevation, with the second greatest of these behind Tharsis being Hellas Crater. Entirely out of reach of the equator, groundwater sapping would begin here long after the chasms further north. Nevertheless, valleys like Dao and Niger Vallis have still managed to develop off the low relief volcano Hadriacus Mons. Even further south sit the Harmacus and Rayul valleys, draining groundwater directly from the Promethea Terra highlands. But it's the Axius and Mad valleys that truly test the limits of how far south water will flow on Mars, extending past 60 degrees south. We'll find similar latitudinal limitations in the valleys feeding into Argyre Planitia, with Sirius, Zinge, and Doanus Vallis, which extends all the way down to 64 degrees south. Further from the equator than any other major erosion feature I could find, meaning this is likely where water becomes ice, even on a Nowakian Mars. As for the northern hemisphere, drainage features aren't as plentiful, a result of most of the north being lowland plains, or in other words, exactly where all of this water is draining into. Where the land does extend northward into what's known as Arabia Terra, a number of smaller valleys feed into this Boreum seabed up to 50 degrees north before the landform itself retracts back south. Elsewhere in the north, valleys coming off the planet's second largest volcanic province, Elysium, barely make it up to this mark, with trails for the Hrad Vallis disappearing into the seabed somewhere around 45 degrees. The only erosion features I found further north was this seeming valley over Arabia and this one above Tempaterra, neither of which I could even find a name for. 
Due to its position at what's essentially the bottom of the sole ocean bed of the planet, water would pool around the northern ice cap, bringing water from the equator all the way back up to the poles, completing the water cycle. What this all means is that if we see water flowing all the way up to these latitudes, we'll know that we've reached the furthest extent of the Martian magnetosphere, atmosphere, and hydrosphere, opening up the door for the next and final step, building a native Martian biosphere. Hi, I hope you all enjoyed watching. If you did and you would like to know more about building a Martian ecosystem, then make sure you subscribe so you don't miss my next video when it comes out. If you're a fan of this Mars series so far and you want to help me continue making these, you can head over to my Patreon, like all of these people going by on screen who helped make this possible. Lastly, if none of these names or places made any sense, you might want to check out my Introduction to Martian Geography video next. Thanks!